I'm Shannon. And I'm Jay. We're on the CSA ferry on the way to Port Lincoln. Can't wait to get there. And before we do that, Shannon, I've always wanted to go in the captain's booth. I'm going to go and check it out. Before you do that, I'm going to go grab a cuppa. The CESA ferry has been transporting passengers across the Spencer Gulf since December 2006. The luxurious car and passenger ferry cuts about 250 kilometres off the journey between Wallaroo and Lucky Bay. The ferry offers travellers a relaxing and fast mode of transport to split up the journey to Port Lincoln. Very excited, I'm with John, I'm up front of the ship, he is the captain. We are in some safe hands, I'm told. Absolutely. How long have you been a uh, driver? Uh, over 40 years. 40 years. Uh, have you always wanted to be a captain of a ship? Well, I was introduced to the water when I was pretty young. I used to go down my uncle, watch him sailing at the Adelaide beaches every weekend. Yeah. And uh, my grandmother used to keep me on a lead and wouldn't let me go. So, <laughs> oh, that's and nice. and I, obviously my uncle couldn't rig his yacht without my help. So I had to get in the water and help him and launch the boat. So, and at, at the end of the day, he would take me out for a sail after he finished racing. And, and that to me would just blew me away. It's a fantastic sport for kids to get into sailing and I was hooked. And so, after that it was in the blood and now there's at, no stopping Absolutely, no, no. Once you're into boats, you're in for life because it, it's, it's here every day and there's no two days the same, everything. Can you explain to me, I, I thought I was going to come up here and steer, you know, like you see, like a big steering wheel. We don't really have a steering wheel here. What kind is this for? Uh, we've got... We've got three systems of steering on this vessel. We've got a little, this is actually our, uh, instead of a wheel, we like use a joystick. It's joystick from my uh, console gaming at home. That's it, it's like the uh, same thing. And it's got a, uh, uh, you can transfer the stations out on the wing out there, and that looks like a bread box out there. It's a stainless steel box. We've got controls out there for when we're maneuvering into the marina or alongside. We can get a better perspective of where the side of the vessel is, because being that's uh, 20 metres wide, it's very difficult to get a, a good perspective when you're in a close to pylons and, and jetties, etc. With these two rudders, we've got two controls. We can split the actual rudders and turn the two rudders independently. And uh, when we're out there, we just use the throttle. So we go ahead, it'll take the vessel that way, go ahead on this, wow. on the other side, it'll take it that way. And it's very technical because there's computer screens everywhere. So if I touch this button, just joking. Well, that's the trend now, see the us older fellas have got to keep up with the technology, uh, otherwise you get a big brand across here that says dinosaur. So you've, got, you've really got <laughs> to keep fossil. up with it. That's the it. old fossil. And it's no good this, oh, I don't use that, I don't trust that, because that doesn't work anymore. You've got to be up with it. John, I'm very, I'm very honoured to be able to sit up here and have a chat with you. But before we leave, I've noticed this little bit of a, uh, a memento. Uh, can you explain that? This for being a captain, what is with this? Well, this is actually our autopilot. So when I need to go to the men's room or something, I put him in command and, and he, he steers the boat. So Don't the crew ever laugh at you? Oh, I, yes, I, I do get some funny looks at times, but we put him in different places every now and then and you've got to sort of play spot the, uh, spot the bunny. So. so it's just like a running joke? Yeah, it is. It's, a, it, it's quite a cute little bunny, don't you think? Yep, if you just hop aside, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, and land this for us safely, if that's okay. Okay, yes, sir. Yep, the seat this is the steering sit here. Sit down and uh, I'll... Uh, and the brake pedal's down there. Beautiful. If you, you need to pump All under control, John. Go and have a coffee thank and you. I'll steer this bad boy home. Okay, thanks very much. Good. Thank you. CESA Ferries also places great importance on marine life and the environment and have received recognition by the Australian Marine Environment Protection Association. Designed to be as energy efficient as possible, the ferry has a potential to reduce more than 25,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions annually by taking cars off the roads. But the eco-friendly aspect of the ferry does not take away from the luxurious onboard features. The boat has an air-conditioned cabin and lounge, cafe, kids' play zone and wireless internet and an outdoor observation deck giving you plenty of room to spread out. 
Now, Nicole, we're crossing Spencer Gulf. How long does it take to go from Wallaroo? It's approximately two hours on the water. And I loved it because we just drove in, parked my car, hopped upstairs, you beauty. Yep. Now, one of the things I think that is awesome uh, to park your car and come on the ferry is uh, you save petrol from driving right around <laughs> the other side. And can you tell me some other advantages of coming on board? Yeah, you'll save wear and tear on your vehicle. You didn't think of that. You wouldn't think of that, no. Think of that. No, you don't. <laughs> no. We will save on driver fatigue because you're not staying on the road for that extra two and a half hours. Um, if you've got your own laptop or iPad or tablet, you've got free Wi-Fi on board. So, so no kangaroos will jump no out. No kangaroos will come right. and jump out at you. Yeah, well, there's so no sea kangaroos no, or anything like No, no flying kangaroos. No. And if you're a family travelling with young kids, you don't have the constant stopping to go to the toilet, the onboard cafe and toilets on board. Toilets on board is always an advantage because I know the crew <laughs> are always saying, I need the toilet. So that is a really, really cool one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As we arrive safely in Port Lincoln, we catch up with true local Steve Pocock who knows everything there is to know about the area. Now retired from his job as a local tour operator, Steve has agreed to show us around of our very own personal guide. Well Steve, we made it to Port Lincoln and we're up here at Winters Hill and I can tell you what, I know why it's called Winters Hill, it's a bit chilly. <laughs> oh well, better than Adelaide, that's where the wind's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> and we can see Port Lincoln behind us here, can you tell me how it's founded? Matthew Flinders sailed in here in 1802. He was the first European to see these harbours. Um, the harbour area is about five times the size of Sydney Harbour, so he thought it was pretty good. He actually named it after his home area in Lincolnshire. Uh, he was born in Donington, Lincolnshire. So all the names around here. Um, you can see out here a whole heap of islands. Well, they're all named after various villages. There's uh, about uh, 28 islands directly behind us out of the 90 islands on Eyre Peninsula. So it's a wonderful area. It's a beautiful area. Steve, I understand that Port Lincoln was considered to be our state capital. Why was that so? The um, South Australia Company thought the harbour area here was good. They sent Colonel William Light in here on the rapid in 1836, in mid-1836, even before Adelaide had been chosen. Light surveyed the area. There wasn't enough fresh water. And a little bit later on, he chose Adelaide instead. I reckon that's brilliant. Look, no suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you did mention all these beautiful islands here. Um, some of them are, you know, got pastoral leases and everything. Uh, what are they all used for? Well, the majority of them are actually national park, but immediately behind us, Boston Island, um, is a is a sheep farm. Um, and Thistle Island, the big one right off in the distance behind us, is actually a holiday island these days. There's about 20 homes out there. You mentioned that there are a lot of national parks around here, 60,000 hectares. What sort of wildlife can you find around here? Oh, definitely kangaroos, emus. Actually, Lincoln National Park has close to 200 species of birds. It's only a small part of it. You said 60,000 hectares here. There's a big water reserve in between the two national parks, which puts it well up over 100,000 hectares immediately south of Port Lincoln. On Air Peninsula these days, uh, in total, there's probably in the vicinity of about five or six million hectares of conservation areas. And if you look at a map and all those green bits, it's, it's, and it's, it's wonderful for people that, or into birds or into the wildlife. But one thing that we do have here is a tremendous wildflower season on Lower Air Peninsula. It's so different to the rest of South Australia because we're more like Western Australia. Um, so I suppose you have all those beautiful, vibrant colours. Oh yes, it's all there. And uh, it's really a case of getting down on your hands and knees though and finding all the delicate little orchids and that. And, and there's even a, a local publication purely on orchids. So it, it, it just... Uh, there's so much to see and do. Well, Steve, how about we get down from this hill and go check out the coastline now? How much time you got? There's about 100 beaches within an hour's drive of Port <laughs> 100 Lincoln. 100 beaches? Yeah. Can't wait. I love oh, the beach. I reckon we could pick girl. a couple out. A beautiful township overlooking Boston Bay, Port Lincoln makes an ideal base to explore the coast and experience the Air Peninsula. It is famous for its surrounding rugged peninsula with cliffs, sand dunes, sheltered bays and sandy beaches. Some of the highlights can be reached with just a 30 minute drive away from Port Lincoln. Steve takes us down to Sleaford Bay to show us the brilliant display of rich colours and we were not disappointed with the view. Like 30 other locations, Sleaford Bay was named by Matthew Flinders after villages in his local home in Lincolnshire. The area has been named as one of the newest marine parks and its protection from development provides home to many different species of birds and marine animals. If you're lucky enough, you may even spot a whale swimming around the area. This place truly has something for everyone. 
With its cliffs dating back thousands of years, it is a perfect place for nature lovers to appreciate the beauty of the area and even do some rock fishing. An undoubtedly appealing location for travellers, the bay is also a loved spot by locals to come and enjoy the time with the family. Yeah, as kids we would all play on the sand hills over there, wouldn't you? But uh, 20,000 years ago, it would have been a different story. The sea would have been 60 kilometres to the south of us on the edge of the continental shelf. And this was a big limestone plain. And of course, Europe and North America are all covered in ice. So as that ice melted, the sea level rose like a big bulldozer coming in and pushed these sand hills up. Because of climate change, I suppose. Then. Yeah. And uh, all of South Australia's west coast has been built by climate change over the last million years. You can see it all there. And the granite base, these granite rocks you can see behind us, are about two and a half thousand million years old. So there's a big disparity in it. Yeah. What do you reckon? Over to the sand hills to have a play? I reckon we should go see if we can roll down the sand hills, Steve. Yeah, if you're rolling down the sand hills, you're not getting to my car afterwards. <laughs> as much as we all agreed that rolling in the sand hills wasn't the best idea, nothing stopped us from running up and down. And sure enough, Shannon was the first one to try it out. While a popular attraction for its natural beauty, Port Lincoln is also known as the seafood capital of Australia. It produces an array of fresh seafood caught daily for both domestic and export markets. The Port Lincoln Marina is a deeper and wider than most other water channels in Australia to ensure that larger vegetables can safely cruise out to sea. As a place of luxury, leisure and relaxation, the marina also allows you to explore the waters through swimming, canoeing and snorkelling. Hundreds of boats contribute to the local fishing industry as they enter into the marina to unload their catch every day. This also is the case for the local supplier of the Fresh Fish Place Seafood Factory just a couple of minutes away from the marina. Operating for over 10 years, the family-owned business has created a seafood service dedicated to supplying the freshest product to the region's restaurants, hotels, clubs and fish shops. They also manage an on-premise fish store and a cafe. There's a huge variety of fish, squid, crab, prawns that caught daily as well as other local produced products. The owner Craig McCarthy gave us a private tour in the oyster room and that means one thing, getting our hands dirty. Tell you what, you cannot get any fresher than this oyster that just come out of the water. That's right, straight from the nice waters of Coffin Bay. And uh, as you can see my nice physique, uh, I like a bit of tucker and I love a good oyster. I'm always lazy, I always get my oysters already prepared for me on a tray. I've always wanted to open one, can you show me the right way? I'm going to try sure and be, I'm going to give it a go. Okay. Alright, let's go this uh, side. Do I get to wear the glove? Alright, here we go. Ah, okay. beautiful. Right, knife in that hand. Yep. And then oyster there. Now make sure... You push that in now, so... Yeah. Make sure you're not going to slip. So hang on to it tight. Yep. With, with your hands like that. And then you're going to push about there and now do the drill bit. That's right. Now, wedge it open a bit. Leave the knife there. Leave it, Leave it in there. there. Wedge it open. And then now scrape it along the top. This way. Towards Back me. Towards you. Kind of letting the oyster open. Oh, I sort of oh, cheated. Yeah, that's... Not, not to... That's Is okay. that passable, boss? If you, if you want your oyster in two, yeah, that's okay. But I wouldn't yeah. get a day job, in other words, what you're trying to say. Now, look for that adductor muscle, which you've left half of it on there, and just cut down the side of the side shell there. and free it up like that. Now, slip the knife down that way. That way. And, and see if you can flip it over. Oh, like, oh, a, pa like a pancake. And don't cut it while you're doing it. And don't oh, cut it while yeah. you're doing it. So that would have to be a second, would it? Well, it's kind of worse. It could be even dog's breakfast. Now, Craig, I've got to take 12 with me, right? There's got to be a faster way than the way I did it. <laughs> and a better way. And there is two. And there's this knife here. Do you want me to show you how yeah. to do it? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're better, I think. I don't know what I did okay, there. Okay, I'll swap places Okay, we'll go you. this side. <laughs> it's like a tattoo gun. Yes, this is an air knife. Pneumatic tool. Like a little jackhammer. Jeez. Just makes it easier to get in here. Open it up like that and then cut it. And it just... That's a, a lot, lot quicker, quicker and easier, isn't it? And that's ready to go on the shell. Well, I reckon I'm going to give that a go, finish off the 12, and uh, thank you very much for your time, Craig. You're most welcome, Joe. Joe, good job chuckling those oysters. They look delicious. Oh, they smell absolutely divine. You cannot get any fresher than this. I can't wait to take them back to Michael. He's going to love them. Ooh. 
There's so much fresh seafood available at Port Lincoln and today Michael have brought some lovely fresh oysters for you. Yeah, brilliant. I, I love oysters. Um, I usually eat them raw, you know, a bit of lemon, but um, today I'm going to cook them very, very gently, just poach them um, and serve them with some risoni, which is uh, a pasta that looks a little bit like rice. So the first thing we need to do is get our risoni on. Just give it one quick stir. And now we can work on our sauce. I've got a pan on quite a high heat here. And what I've got here is actually the liquid left over from the oysters, so I've kept that when I open them. I'm going to add a tiny bit of fish stock to that as well. So we want to reduce that down quite a lot. I don't know if you can smell that. that, that you get that briny mm, smell of the ocean, yeah. and that's one of my favourite things about oysters. They taste like the sea. It's quite a loose sauce, this one, which is what we want. We're just we're going to plate up our risoni in our plate, and then we're going to just coat it in the sauce. Then I'm just going to add some shallots. I've just got some really finely diced shallots, and they're going to add some sweetness to this liquid and also little tiny bites of texture. Okay, Shannon, so you can see here our oyster liquid and our fish stock is reduced down to not a lot at all. And we're just going to add some cream now. We're just going to allow that to reduce down as well. So by the time that's done, our risoni should be ready. You can see it's bubbling up nicely. Our risoni's cooked and I've strained it. Our sauce is ready to go, so we just need to finish it off, off the heat. It's nice and warm still, so we're going to add just some chives. For a finely sliced, we'll keep a couple for garnishing. And you want to chuck a spoon of those little caviar eggs in, just a spoonful of those. Just stir them through, these are just lightly poach. And then we're going to chuck in our oysters. So do you want to put four oysters in? And again, we're just going to lightly poach them in our liquid. But they're not going to cook through, they're still going to be a little bit raw in the centre, which is how I like my oysters, but they're going to have a nice flavour. So to plate up, I'm just going to bring our risoni over here. I'm just going to put a little sort of mound of risoni in the middle of the bowl. That's going to be a little spot to sit our oysters. Then I'm going to grab our oysters. As I said they're just lightly poached, so we're just going to put them, we'll do three on each one. And we're going to then just spoon our sauce in and around. So we want that sauce to sort of sink through into the risoni. Another sprinkle of our chives. And do you just want to do a little zest of lemon? Over the top. Beautiful, just a little bit of freshness at the end. And a bit of beautiful colour as well. Correct. So that's our risoni with oysters and chives. Tell you what, Michael, I didn't know how many things you could do with oysters and it looks amazing. You can't wait to try it. Thank you. We are heading towards the Neptune Islands, an area famous for shark cage diving. The two groups of islands are located just outside the entrance to the Spencer Gulf. With South Australia being one of only three places in the world where shark cage diving with great whites is practiced, it is a definite must for thrill seekers when visiting Port Lincoln. Can you tell me about all the islands that we can see in front of us here? Uh, basically just located down to Port Lincoln. Uh, we're running at the moment down the side of the eastern side of Port Lincoln National Park, which we call Jasua Peninsula. Uh, there's a group of eight islands we call the Thorny Passage. And the story behind that was in 1802, Matthew Splinders was circumnavigating Australia. Um, he come to this area, he was running low on food and water. Out of necessity, he put eight of his top crew members into a little wooden boat, asked them to go to shore to get some supplies. Back in then, in those days, a lot of sailors didn't have the uh, swimming experience that a lot of people have today. And uh, they happened to overturn their little wooden vessel and uh, unfortunately they all drowned. So out of uh, honour of those men, there happened to be eight men, eight islands in the area. So Flinders named the islands in size to rank of those men. And do you come out and rain, hail or shine, all sorts of weathers? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, um, you know, with the nice sized vessel that we hear on Calypso Star 2, um, it's, it's very capable of taking on some uh, rather large weather. Uh, if the seasons swell or up, we might uh, have a little lumps and bumps on the way, I guess you could say, to North Neptunes. But once we're there, uh, we find uh, that the, the layout of the two islands of North Neptune uh, allows us to anchor up in a nice calm spot and uh, we can conduct our shark cage diving from there. Well Dan, thanks a lot and um, I'm going to go downstairs and have a coffee before I have to jump in with some great white sharks. We are getting closer to our destination where the crew will throw Burley into the water which is sure to attract the sharks as they can smell blood from up to five kilometres away. Well, I'm going to go jump into my wetsuit and hopefully it won't be my blood that they're tasting today. Ready? Yeah. I'm excited. It'll be fun. I'll hold your hand down there for you and make sure that you don't come back up. Right. <laughs> Two steps down into the cage. Enjoy yourself. Adult great whites are on the average about four to five metres long and can weigh up to 1,100 kilos. This makes them the largest predatory fish on the earth. 
Typically found in cool coastal waters throughout the world, grey whites are listed as an endangered species. Humans are largely responsible for the decrease in population from overfishing and accidental catching in nets. Grey white sharks are able to find their prey using an extra sensor called the Ampullae lorazini. This sense enables them to detect the electromagnetic fields emitted by any living animal. When a living creature moves, it sends out an electric field which great whites can detect as a little as a half a billionth of a volt. A great white, if close enough, can even detect the faint electric pulse of a heartbeat. Although most fish have this ability, it is far less precise than that of the fearsome shark. Great white sharks are complex creatures to understand. The females dominate the males, while larger sharks dominate the smaller sharks, and the residents have power over newcomers. They usually hunt by themselves and tend to resolve conflicts through rituals and displays. Although they rarely resort to fighting one another, it is not unheard of. Some sharks have been found with bite marks that match their own species. It seems that sharks may give a warning bite if another shark comes too close, or simply to show their dominance. The great white shark has to consistently keep moving to prevent sinking and suffocation. The shark's reputation as a ferocious predator is well deserved. They are ambush hunters and they take their prey by surprise by attacking them from below. As indiscriminate eating machines, they have around 300 teeth in their mouths which all slant inwards in order to hold on to their prey. James the deckhand, mate, you have got an incredible job. Uh, can you tell us about the great white shark? I've always had a passion for the Great White. Um, now being able to work hand in hand with them is, is even better. Um, as much as we seem to think we, we know lots about them, they keep proving us wrong time and time again. Um, it's still very little known about the animal. Um, and along with us and all the other shark cage dive operators, we um, do our best to conduct as much research as possible um, to, to bring it back into the industry to, uh, to educate the public more on, on what the white sharks are about. White pointers give birth to live pups. Um, they've caught females in early gestational period that have had, a, um, had four or five pups in their womb. Um, they've caught females in later gestational period that have only had one pup in the womb. So what they seem to suspect is that um, she may start off with three or four pups and it's the strongest eat the weakest in the womb and then they give live birth to one shark. I noticed today when I was uh, having a dive, uh, one of the sharks was tagged. Yes. Uh, is that true? Yes. Yeah, no, so there who, was actually, who did that? There was actually several sharks there today which had tags in them um, and they're an acoustic tag, not a satellite tag. So. Uh, we do a lot of the tagging. Us so how do you do that? What's the process? Because that would... Uh, it's a bit of a tricky process. They're not really the animal that's going to sit there and lie there calmly for you while you put a needle into him. Um, but basically we bring him down the side of the boat. Yeah. Uh, we have a great big pole with a needle on the end of Whoa. it. As he swims past, we give him a little bit of a jab into the dorsal fin. Um, and it's kind of just like going and getting a needle yourself. Tetanus really. needle, good yeah, old tetanus, tetanus needle. needle. Um, the, the tags are designed to last for five years, but they don't necessarily stay in the shark for that long. I heard winter's the best time to go shark diving. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the reason we, we say that is because the, uh, the New Zealand fur seals, they pup in November, December. Those pups will spend four to five months on the rocks before they venture into the water for the first time. So if a seal's never seen a shark, it doesn't know it's going to eat it. Oh. So the sharks know this, so they rock up at the Neptunes around winter time because all of those young pups are just getting in the water for the first time and they know there's a lot of easy meal there. They're very, very uh, clever, aren't they? They are, yes. Millions of years of evolution have made them the ultimate apex predator. And it's like a smorgasbord, really, isn't it? Absolutely. And we all have a good smorgasbord. Yep. Some of the fish we saw down there, why weren't the shark chasing them? Okay, um, sharks are very calculated animals. They assess the risk of them being hurt first. Um, they also then have to work out is it worth them exerting the energy to catch that fish? Is that fish going to give him the energy back that he needs? So they'd rather catch a big seal and get a good feed rather than spend the energy and catch a little seal and not get quite as much back. Is that why the shark come up to the cage as well, just to see whether we were a threat to them? Uh, no, I think he was probably coming up to the cage to see whether he could eat you. Oh, cheesy. Uh, do shark like fatty food? Oh, I, have, well, I don't know. I haven't got close <laughs> enough to ask one. All right, James, thank you very much for having us on board. I was so nervous. You had no idea. No, you did an absolute great <laughs> job, guys. It's a, it's a big step stepping into that cage, but you faced your fear and you did it. So congratulations. Well done. And on behalf of the Calypso Star crew, I'd like to thank you guys for having, having you on board. And, uh, yeah, it's good to see you've got a Calypso Star smile. Well, Jack, I can't believe how many great activities there are in Port Lincoln, even in winter. The seafood is amazing. The sights are spectacular. And I've got a new appreciation for the Great White Shark. If you would like to catch up on today's episode, go to travel.com And make sure you tell all your friends and likers on Facebook. Ooh.